I am also incredibly grateful and excited to introduce our keynote speaker for tonight, who is um, going to help us begin to visualize what else we can do to transform our passion into policy, into change, into reality. Because this is what Dr. Ingrid Waldron has done. She is the hope chair for peace and health in the global peace and social justice program in the Faculty of Humanities of McMaster University. And she teaches peace, environment and health and race, place and geographies of violence in indigenous and black communities in the global peace and social justice program. She also teaches social justice perspectives on gender and health and Previously, she is known to all of us because she taught in the Faculty of Health at Dalhousie University. And she is also a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Women's Health in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Toronto, visiting professor in the International Research Infrastructure on Social Inequalities in Health at the Department of Sociology at McGill University. Her research interests focus on ecological violence and the structural determinants of health. She has a specific interest in the social, political, environmental, and health impacts of inequality and discrimination, the relationship between structural and state violence and the social, structural, and environmental determinants of health, health disparities in racialized communities, environmental racism, climate change inequalities, mental illness, and COVID-19 in Black, Indigenous, immigrant, and refugee communities. Many of us know her as the author, the award-winning author of There's Something in the Water, Environmental Racism in Indigenous and Black Communities, which was turned into a 2020 Netflix documentary of the same name and co-produced by and directed by Elliot Page, as well as her, of course. And she is the founder and director of Environmental Noxiousness, Racial Inequities and Community Health Project, the Enriched Project, which inspired the federal private members bill, a national strategy respecting environmental racism and environmental justice bill C-230, which was introduced in the House of Commons in February of 2020 and approved in March of 2021 and as amendments June 2021. And she also co-founded the Anti-Environmental Racism Coalition. And so I cannot think of a better person to continue to inspire us to transform our passion and vision for change into reality. And so it is with great pleasure that I invite her to lead us, inspire us, and share her wisdom with each of us. Great, thank you, Nadia, and thanks for inviting me uh, to this event. Really great to be here. Okay, can everyone see that? Yes. Advocacy, social justice, partnerships, impact. Over the past several years, those four words have described my goals as a professor and researcher at Dalhousie University and now as a professor at McMaster University. While I always wanted to achieve, sorry, while I always wanted to achieve these objectives in my work before I became a university professor, I struggled to come up with ideas that were also creative, outside the box, or left of center. I've long admired people who were great at devising innovative and creative ideas, approaches, and tools to address and solve real world problems experienced by racially marginalized communities. And I wanted to make similar contributions. My desire to create real change in these communities through advocacy, creativity, social justice approaches, and partnerships in ways that made a real impact was bolstered by a colleague and the television program. It was the executive director, 
of a community-based organization I was employed at in Toronto in 2007 who impressed me the most. I had often found myself in awe of the ease with which he was able to come up with creative and original services and initiatives that were not only innovative, but also addressed real world challenges for communities that were struggling with systemic racism, income insecurity and poverty, food insecurity, poor health outcomes and challenges accessing opportunities to start and grow businesses. My desire to create real change in marginalized communities grew even stronger while I was watching the CNN series Black in America back in 2010. The show highlighted change makers in the African American community who were leading innovative and impactful projects and initiatives that resulted in real change in African American communities. I became even more passionate and committed to doing the same but continue to struggle to find one or more projects that would allow me to realize this goal. Then without much effort on my part, that opportunity landed at my feet two years later in 2012, when an environmental activist in Halifax approached me to conduct a project on environmental racism in Mi'kmaq and African Nova Scotian communities, a topic I was unfamiliar with and consequently was hesitant to take on initially. That project was the Environmental Noxiousness, Racial Inequities in Community Health Project, the Enrich Project, a collaborative, interdisciplinary, multi-sector, community-based research project that is investigating and addressing the social, economic, political, and health effects of environmental racism in Mi'kmaq and African Nova Scotian communities across Nova Scotia. Since 2021, the Enrich Project has been able to engage multi multidisciplinary partnerships that have included Indigenous and African Nova Scotian community leaders and members, public health and other government officials, environmental organizations and other NGOs and professors, researchers and students in health, sociology, law, environmental science, environmental studies, community health, planning and political science. So what is environmental racism? A question that I used to get asked quite often. Well, this is how James Desmond, a longtime environmental activist in the African Nova Scotian community in Lincolnville, defined uh, environmental racism at a 2013 workshop that I held in that community as a way to get to know that community and develop relationships. James says the practice has been locating industrial waste sites next to African Nova Scotian native and poor white communities, communities that don't have a base to fight back. You ask if that's environmental racism, it's environmental racism to its core. And I like this quote, I use this quote often because it's very simple, but it's layered. And basically what James is saying is that environmental racism is about disproportionality. It's about the fact that industry and government tend to overwhelmingly place dangerous projects uh, toxic projects in primarily non-white or racialized communities, but there are few cases where poor white communities are impacted by environmental racism. I can think of one in, in Nova Scotia called Harriet's Field, uh, which is a low-income rural white community that has been trying to address contaminated water since the 1980s. However, it is an issue that overwhelmingly impacts people of color and indigenous uh, people. So when I hesitantly agreed to take on the project, it was because it would allow me to work with marginalized communities. And because I realized after reading a few articles on the topic that it had significant implications for health. And that was most interesting to me as a health researcher. As a researcher with expertise on marginalized communities and the intersection of social justice and health, I recognized that I could make a contribution to the topic of environmental racism and advocate for communities that were being impacted by contaminated water and air pollution both of which were impacting their health and resulting in illnesses such as respiratory illness, reproductive illnesses, and cancer. In fact, environmental health inequities across racial dimensions have been well-documented in the literature, which shows that indigenous and racialized communities in Canada are exposed to greater health risks compared to white communities because they are more likely to be spatially clustered around these toxic sites. And I, as I said earlier, these illnesses could, certainly, could include cancer and respiratory illnesses, but they also include uh, cardiovascular disease, 
reproductive morbidity, including preterm births, temporary liver dysfunction, and seizures. Studies also provide evidence that the health effects of environmental racism are not only racialized, but also gendered, impacting Indigenous and Black women in specific ways, most notably the impacts on reproductive health, such as infertility, miscarriages, premature births, premature menopause, reproductive system cancers, and an inability to produce healthy children due to compromised endocrine and immune systems while in utero. So over the last 10 years, uh, the Enriched Project has been trying to address uh, the problem of environmental racism in very specific ways. And one of the things I always say is that I'm open to anything or anyone who wants to support this project. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's multidisciplinary, it's intersectional. And uh, I think the, my, the values that I have in terms of making sure that everybody is involved and people are collaborating and that communities are leading uh, the projects that the Enriched Project supports. I think those are the values that are inherently uh, the most important part of the Enriched Project. Um, but also, as I said earlier, being creative and open and innovative. And, and what that requires is for me to say yes a lot. You know, So if people want to meet with me in my office, instead of turning them down and assuming uh, that uh, they don't fit, um, I've always said yes, and great things have come from me saying yes and meeting with people who want to meet with me. So over the years, I've tried to do a number of things to address the Enriched Project in different ways, because I think uh, there's no one way to address this particular issue. And one of the ways I've tried to address, is, to address the issue is through education, uh, because education creates awareness. And uh, when I started the project, as I said, uh, the question I got asked the most is, what is environmental racism? Very strange term. It doesn't seem to be believable to me. Uh, can you explain it? And I, I don't get that question as much anymore, not in Nova Scotia, because that's where I've done most of the uh, awareness raising. Uh, I get it in other parts of Canada. So I think, uh, I think a lot of Nova Scotians are aware of this topic now. But I still feel that I have to continue to raise awareness and do these public engagement events because there will always be uh, someone who doesn't understand the term. And as I said before, if I want to, I want people to be empathic around this particular issue, then they have to understand it. They have to have information. Uh, so here is one of the many uh, on the screen, one of the many public engagement events I've held uh, that the Enriched Project has organized. This was in 2015 at the Central Library. Uh, like any event, as you know, you want to have people with different perspectives, uh, different ideas, and you have Lenore Zan, MP Lenore Zan, former MP Lenore Zan, uh, providing a political perspective. You've got members of the community. You've got Lynn Jones uh, in the green. In the center, you've got Mary Desmond from Lincolnville, uh, Caroline Wright Parks from Halifax Partnership. And then at, right at the edge, you've got Doreen Bernard from the Indigenous community, Sabag and Agadee First Nation. Uh, so the raising awareness projects that I've been involved in have, in have included workshops, academic and public symposiums, conferences, film screenings, and other public engagement events uh, in Nova Scotia, other parts of Canada, the US, and Europe. And of course, as a, as a professor and researcher, I have to publish, particularly because policymakers like data. Uh, they like uh, they like statistical data, quantitative data, but they also like stories. They like qualitative data. I am primarily a qualitative researcher, so I like sharing stories from the front lines. And this book uh, is an aspect of that. This book provides a case study specifically on Nova Scotia, but I talk about cases of environmental racism across Canada, including Saskatchewan, Alberta, Ontario. Um, but Nova Scotia is the jumping off point in this book uh, to explain uh, environmental racism, but also to share how it's experienced by racialized communities. Um, uh, chapter five focuses specifically on the health and mental health effects of environmental racism. And much of the other chapters focus on the grassroots mobilizing, the grassroots struggle over the past uh, 70 years um, that Indigenous and Black communities have engaged in in order to address this particular issue. Data can also include mapping. Uh, I worked with my research assistant to create a map. One layer of the map is for Indigenous communities, Mi'kmaq communities. The other layer is for African Nova Scotian communities. You can find this map. It looks a bit different on my website. 
But this is really important because people doubted what I was saying. They didn't think that environmental racism was real. And when this map was created, then the naysayers came back to me on email and said, okay, I can see it now, um, right? So what this shows is that, you know, the communities are close to pulp and paper mills, incinerators, dumps, and landfills. It doesn't say that white communities are not near these sites, but it does say that black and indigenous communities are, and they are disproportionately located near these sites. So for me, this is a data gathering tool. It's a policy tool. It's an educational tool because a lot of Dow professors have said to me that they use this in their classroom. So I'm really proud of this map because I think it's an interesting form of data collection. Um, and this is something that I'm going to be using to create a Canada wide map. So I'm working with my coalition right now um, to use this map, this Nova Scotia map, to create a Canada wide map on instances of environmental racism, but also climate change, which is not on this map, um, in racialized uh, Indigenous and other communities of color. In 2016, uh, after I met James Desmond, who you saw earlier in the photo, three years later, I said to myself, I don't think what the community wants is probably going to happen. What they would like to see happen is that the landfill would be redirected to another area. And, I, and you know that landfill has been there since 1974. So I said, I don't know if that's going to happen, but what are some other ways we can support this community? And we decided to do a water testing project in Lincolnville because they had long been concerned about contaminated water, but they didn't want the government to test their water because they thought that the government would say everything is fine. So they, they didn't trust the government, but I thought, well, they would trust us, we're not government. So I got together a hydrogeologist, one aspect of you know how I like to work collaboratively and in an interdisciplinary way. So I got environmental science students from the University of Waterloo, I believe it was. I got a student from, from Dalhousie. I got a hydrogeologist uh, from Nova Scotia who had experience working in the Department of Environment, but had a very much a community-based lens. And we decided to do this, this project on Lincolnville. And what we did was we collected some maps. We did a profile on the community. We tested their water. We wrote a final report. We went back to the community. We shared our findings. And we did a workshop about how to manage your drinking water supply. And that led to this NGO called Rural Water Watch. What you see on the screen here is the acronym. Rural Water Watch, which we created in 2017 in the spring, because we thought that the project in Lincolnville went really well, and we thought, oh, this would be a great NGO. Uh, so that's what we did. It's now a charitable organization. Um, so what we're doing now is similar to what we did in Lincolnville. We test water in rural uh, Nova Scotian communities, not necessarily Indigenous or Black, any community that is a rural community in Nova Scotia, because rural communities tend to be on well water and well water is more contaminated, we, we uh, test their water. And we started to do um, annual Healthy Wells Day, where we educate people online using infographics and posters and in person about the need to test their well, the need to keep their well healthy because an unhealthy well, a cracked well, an old well uh, can lead to a lot of health issues. So this is something we started and I'm, I just really, I'm really proud of this particular project because I think it's tangible and it allows us to give back to the community. We could do research all the time, I'm a researcher, but sometimes with research, the community doesn't see the benefits of research, right? Um, so it's, for me, this is a really tangible aspect of my project. I also consult with EcoJustice. This is a Canadian law charity across Canada or in certain, in certain uh, cities in Canada. And they opened up an office in Halifax on Hollis Street in 2018. Before that, I was, I was communicating with the Calgary office, but I was happy to find out that they opened an office in Halifax. So I went and met with them and I said, here are some of the communities that I'm working with. I just wanna tell you about what they've been dealing with. And after that meeting, they started to uh, work with some of the communities I've been working with. Um, and their job is to find legal remedies uh, to address community concerns around water contamination and environmental racism. I also realized that I wasn't that involved in climate change and climate change is the most pressing issue, most salient issue of the day. And I thought, well, you know, I, I didn't feel I had enough time to engage in climate change projects because environmental racism is so huge. 
and uh, I was I was involved in so many different things, but I thought it was time. So I connected with Climate Action Services, which um, uh, people who who do consulting there are retired climate scientists, and we connected in late 2019, and then COVID hit, uh, which stopped us in our tracks. We were planning to do some workshops, and then we decided in March that we can go ahead and do those workshops. So we did. And we went to three communities, East Preston, Truro, and Shelburne. And we did climate change adaptation workshops in those communities. And what I find is important with this particular topic is that I find that a lot of racialized communities don't feel close to this topic because I think the messaging doesn't capture them um, in many ways. The messaging has to capture you intellectually and it has to capture you emotionally. And I don't think the climate change scientists do a very good job of capturing us emotionally. So what I wanted to do was to kind of look at these uh, African Nova Scotian communities and say to myself, well, these are low income communities that lack resources. We're asking them to adapt to climate change, but do they have the resources? Do they have the networks? Do they have many of the things that higher income white communities have? No, the answer is no. So we've got to cater uh, these projects to their needs and to the things that they don't have, but also of course to their strengths. Uh, so that was the purpose of this workshop. I think a lot of people went into this workshop not that interested. It took a while to part to get participants, but after the workshop ended, uh, many of them said, or most of them said, we loved it. We want more. So at some point, I need to use the workshop findings, which has been documented in a report, and perhaps do a study on that. And I want to look at climate change impacts in Black communities across Canada. I also mentor students all the time. I mentor and train students. And what I've learned um, with this topic of environmental racism is how inter disciplinary it is. I think I mentioned to you earlier the the students and the faculty that I have engaged sociology and health and medicine and nursing and planning and geography and environmental science and political science like students from students and faculty from all of those disciplines at Dalhousie primarily have reached out to me to help in some way. So uh, I you know what I like to say is that uh, the solution to environmental racism is interdisciplinary connections but the solution to any problem in our world is interdisciplinary. You know, If we continue to get stuck in our silos um, and say that I'm a social worker, so I don't do this, or I can't do this, or I'm a historian, so I can't do this, then that's the problem. Uh, what I've learned is that we have to transcend silos and boundaries. And this project, the Enrich Project, has really shown me that over the years. I use media a lot. I talked earlier about using engagement events to create awareness, but I also use media. And I've just talked to, I think, so many different media outlets over the years. It's very tiring because I do get a lot of requests, um, but I realize I need to continue to do that because there's always gonna be someone who doesn't understand this topic. And if I can create empathy in someone or a group or an organization, then that's what I wanna do. And I do think it helps. I think I get a lot of requests from people professors, high school teachers, but people from ENGOs, community-based organizations who are inviting me to speak about this topic because now they have interest in it because they saw me in the media. So of course, media is most powerful. So I need to continue to do uh, that work. At the end of 2018, uh, Nova Scotia born actor, Elliot Page reached out to me on Twitter. This was a shock. Uh, didn't know why it was happening and didn't think it was Elliot Page. So interestingly enough, I did not follow back. <laughs> and then I came back a few weeks later and I said, okay, uh, this person is promoting my book, uh, saying that he wants to support the community members on the front lines, saying that he wants to support the Enrich Project. This, who is this? And I said to myself, this is Elliot Page. <laughs> I can't believe it. So I said, well, the, you know, I, at least I need to reach out uh, and thank him. So I DM'd him and thanked him. And he, he said, I just want to use my celebrity or my platform to help you. I just don't really know how. So um, uh, what is her name? Who owns the wooden monkey? Uh, the woman who owns the wooden monkey in uh, Halifax and Dart, Lil McPherson, uh, is a longtime friend of Elliot's. And for some reason, I got talking and she knew that I had connected with Elliot. And she said, do you want me to set up a phone call? And I said, well, of course. Um, so late 2018, December, the week of Christmas. Uh, we had a three-way phone call. Then in January, another one, this time with the Mi'kmaq women, the grassroots grandmothers. And we decided to film short 10-minute uh, video clips that we would post on Twitter to create awareness. 
And then when Elliot came up April 13th and shot the film over six days, I went back to Elliot's mother's home and I looked at the film they allowed, because they also allowed me to be a producer, which was a co-producer on the film, which was exciting. I looked at cuts of the film and I said, this is very emotional. I don't think if we do 10 minute clips, this is gonna do this topic justice. Why don't we do a 70 minute film? Why don't we take it to the Berlin Film Festival? Why don't we take it to the Toronto? Like I was, <laughs> you know, cause I'm a film buff. So I'm thinking, let's go big or go home. Like what's the point? And, and the co-director um, Ian Daniel said, you really think so? I said, yeah. So we got it ready quickly for TIFF and we got in, but just to be honest, we got in because Cameron Bailey is a good friend of Elliot because we were past the deadline. We were past the deadline. So that tells you that celebrity, right? So we got in and then um, in 2019, September 9th, we screened the film in Toronto, which was so exciting. We were speaking to different uh, media outlets, Rolling Stone, Time Magazine, the LA Times. But this is another, this is what uh, most researchers want. In fact, you want, this is called knowledge mobilizing, but most people aren't going to have a Netflix documentary, to be honest, or to speak to all these media outlets. So this is, this is prime knowledge mobilizing because we were getting this topic out to the rest of the world. TIFF is international, right? So that's what's great about this is that you can't really get better than this in terms of sharing information. And you know, the kind of response I got back from people was like, Canada, I can't believe Canada has environmental racism. Canada is a clean, nice place and they have so much water. And you know, so people were shocked. It maybe shamed Nova Scotia a bit, uh, uh, maybe, and maybe the government. And that's why I think in late 2019, that's when um, um, Stephen McNeil announced all of a sudden that the mill was gonna close. It's funny, I'm not gonna say it's because of the film, but I think it's very strange that the government has made those promises in the past and right after our film was screened at TIFF and got all this attention in the media, then the week of Christmas 2019, he announced the, the mill would close and that we can't keep making broken promises to the community and that the mill did close, of course, at the end of uh, January 2020. We also learned at the end of 2019 that it would go to Netflix. So it started streaming on Netflix in uh, March of last year. And of course, another kind of great mobilizing. Like you can't get better than Netflix, right? This is worldwide. So people are hearing the message. They're learning about environmental racism, creating empathy. And after it started streaming on Netflix, I got people from around the world emailing me saying how inspiring the black and indigenous women are in the film and what can I do? Which is exactly what I wanted. You know, create awareness, educate, create empathy, and then people act. And also a bill that I've been trying to get passed since I was in Nova Scotia, it was a Nova Scotia bill, now a federal bill, um, hasn't gotten passes yet, wiped off the table when uh, the election was called this year, all private members bills are wiped off the table. Uh, I actually sent a, a letter to Justin Trudeau on Tuesday um, with a coalition, with my coalition members asking him to reintroduce this bill as a government bill rather than a private members bill. So I'll see what happens with this bill. I keep talking about my coalition. Uh, well, last year, um, Naolo Charles in Toronto reached out to me. Um, he said, I really love the Enrich Project, but have you ever thought of going beyond Nova Scotia? I said, yeah, I've been thinking about that for years, but I just don't have the capacity. He said, well, why don't we co-found an NGO? And we did. We co-founded what is now called, we changed the name recently, it's called the Canadian Coalition for Environmental and Climate Justice. And we have so far engaged over 50 different NGOs in the climate and environment sector, including, including David, Suzuki, David Suzuki Foundation, EcoJustice, the Canadian Association for Physicians of the Environment, the East Coast Environmental Law Association, the West Coast, on and on and on. And we do our work through six different uh, working groups. I wanna talk a little bit more about how I put research into action. So my interest in combining advocacy and partnerships, creativity and social justice to address the health issues affecting racially marginalized community continued when I agreed to conduct a new study that would inform a new health service for black women in Nova Scotia at the request of social worker, Mario Roll, who leads Nova Scotia Health Brotherhood Initiative. The purpose of my study was to examine experiences of mental illness and help seeking among black women in the HRM to inform the Nova Scotia Sisterhood Initiative, a proposed health initiative for black women and Nova Scotia health. 
To ensure that intersectionality was central to the study, I recruited Black women who were diverse based on culture, citizenship, status, gender identity, sexual orientation, age, socioeconomic status, and disability. The rationale for this study was threefold. There's a lack of research data on Black women's experiences with mental illness in Nova Scotia. There are few, if any, uh, health and mental health services that address the needs of Black women in the HRM, and the data collected would inform the proposed sisterhood initiative, the first health service for Black women in Nova Scotia. My study findings indicate that mental health services in the HRM do not adequately meet the needs of Black women, and that the proposed Nova Scotia sisterhood in initiative should offer community-driven, holistic, trauma-informed services that respond to Black women's personal, social, economic, and community experiences, and how these shape their experiences with mental illness and help seeking. I was thrilled when it was announced in May of this year that the Nova Scotia government will provide funding in the amount of $200,000 to create the Sisterhood Initiative. This research is another example of how important it is to conduct research that doesn't just sit on a shelf, but that uh, centers advocacy and social justice for marginalized communities, and that has real impacts on the ground. Grabbing another opportunity to make real change in the Black community in Nova Scotia and in the health system, I accepted an invitation in late 2018 to join the African Nova Scotian Health Strategy at Nova Scotia Health to conduct research that would inform the new African Nova Scotian Health Strategy. The three main goals of the strategy are to recommend culturally appropriate strategies to address health inequities and injustices and to improve the quality of healthcare services, to build partnerships between NSHA or now Nova Scotia Health IWK and people of African descent at the local level, and to influence and advocate for the collection and use of race and ethnicity identifiers in data collection to support and inform planning and service delivery. There were several recommendations that came out of my study report, um, but the most important ones include the collection of race, ethnicity, and language identifiers that can be linked to the Nova Scotia Health Card to show rates of certain health concerns and illnesses and rates of health service utilization among people of African descent living in Nova Scotia. And the other one was hire a full-time permanent African Nova Scotian health manager at Nova Scotia Health to move the recommendations in the study report forward and to advocate at the local and provincial levels to address the health needs of people of African descent. This involves ensuring that job descriptions created by Nova Scotia Health are more accommodating to the skills and experiences of people of African descent. I am pleased to say that both recommendations have been implemented. Rhonda Atwell was hired in 2020 as the first ever African Nova Scotian services consultant to lead health projects and address health issues experienced by people of African descent across the province. Nova Scotia Health has also started collecting disaggregated race-based health data that will provide the community with a better understanding on the role that race and other factors play in illness causation and health outcomes, a first for the province. As I close my presentation, I would like to leave you with some food for thought on how you can center social justice, advocacy, partnerships, and innovation in your work as a social worker, whether it be through clinical practice, research, or teaching. First, Partnerships that transcend disciplinary and professional silos and boundaries should be the cornerstone to what you do, since the solutions to most or all the challenges facing racialized peoples and other marginalized peoples lie in interdisciplinary and multi-sectoral collaborations. The value in bringing together people with diverse educational backgrounds, skills, approaches, and philosophies is that they can fill gaps in knowledge and skills that you lack. Creativity, innovation, and out-of-the-box approaches are also crucial for advocating on and addressing the social, political, and health challenges faced by mar marginalized communities. And most importantly, developing relationships with and listening to the stories of racialized and other marginalized communities must be the first step in advocating for social justice in these communities and transforming the health system. While the health system will always value research and data, Advocacy must involve both the head and the heart. In other words, sharing the stories and experiences of communities must go hand in hand with intellectual work. If your goal is to play a role in the health system, in health system transformation, that leads to positive change in racialized communities and other marginalized communities. I'd like to thank you for listening.
Uh, wow, I have the um, great honor of uh, being able to graciously thank uh, Dr. Walden for her presentation tonight uh, and for inspiring us. Uh, again, I think I am very uh, welcoming of your final message that uh, advocacy is about the head and the heart. How do we connect as humans? How do we connect with the land? And how do we inspire forward movement uh, to the type of society that we all want? Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, Thank you. We are, uh, we are appreciative for your words.